Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Sunita Bhavanandan from the Department of Nephrology in Hospital Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the third in the series of the KD Go webinars on kidney health and COVID-19. The focus today is on glomerulonephritis, and we have two eminent speakers. The first is Professor Sidney Tang, who is the Chair Professor of Renal Medicine and the U Endowed Professor in Nephrology at the University of Hong Kong. And the second speaker is Professor Edgar Lerma, who is the Clinical Professor of Medicine in the section of Nephrology, University of Illinois at Chicago College of Medicine in the US. It's currently past midnight for Professor Lerma, and as we only have one hour to cover much ground, I will keep the introduction brief. As you know, this is a webinar focused on glomerular nephritis, and glomerular diseases account for 20 to 25% of CKD worldwide, based on data from ESKD registry. Although all ages may be affected, glomerular diseases are a common cause of CKD among younger patients and may be associated with significant morbidity or mortality. Hence, early diagnosis and optimal management is important to achieve disease control and to prevent progressive um, kidney disease. In the current climate of the global COVID-19 pandemic, clinicians caring for patients with glomerular diseases are often faced with difficult management decisions. These include which patients we can minimize or defer hospital visits and diagnostic procedures on, for example, renal biopsy, how to balance risks of immunosuppression versus risks of uncontrolled disease or disease flares, how to manage patients on immunosuppressive therapy who become exposed to or infected with COVID-19, and finally, how to adapt delivery of healthcare services in line with the need for physical um, distancing or social isolation. So it's very timely for us to have the KDGO webinar today. Its objectives are to share highlights from the new KDGO guidelines on glomerular diseases which are due for release later this year in October, and secondly, to provide insights on special considerations in the management of glomerular nephritis during the COVID-19 pandemic. To save time in the webinar, we will take questions at the end of the second lecture, but please feel free to post your questions at any time via the chat box. So let's start off now with the first lecture by Professor Sidney Tang, who is President-Elect of the Asian Pacific Society of Nephrology, a member of the KDGO Executive Committee, and who holds many other leadership posts in professional bodies, as well as many editorships for um, various journals. Professor Tang was closely involved with the new KDGO DN guidelines as a member of the work group. And today, he has selected highlights from this new guideline to share with us. Over to you, Prof Tang. In 2017, uh, KDGO realized the need to update this guideline, and after three years' work, uh, this uh, final version uh, was uh, out, uh, finally out for public review, and I believe many of you have already received this email uh, dated June the 1st from uh, Jürgen Flögen and Brad Robin uh, inviting you to give comments. Uh, so I would now urge you to um, take a look at this uh, version and provide your comments by June the 30th, which means the last day of this month. So this is going to be the outline of my uh, talk in the next 20 minutes or so. I will focus on some of the major changes of the 2020 guideline from the 2012 guideline, focusing on some general aspects and some chapter-specific changes. And then I will move on to a selected topics of more Asia-Pacific relevance, focusing on lupus nephritis and IgA nephropathy in this guideline. So first of all, uh, is on the point about recommendation and practice points. And we, uh, in this 2020 guideline, we are still using the, the grade system, uh, which uh, will uh, show the strength of the recommendation as level one, meaning a recommendation, and or level two, which means a suggestion, and providing the quality of the supporting evidence. As grade A being high to grade D uh, being very low. So this is uh, probably similar uh, to the previous guideline. And incorporated into the present guideline would be the publication in, uh, in, uh, in an online format, the Magic App, uh, that would facilitate rapid updates as new evidence emerges. So you don't need 
need to wait for the uh, next guideline in a couple of years' time to be updated. So the update will be will be online. Now, the new feature about this uh, new guideline is the incorporation of what we call practice points. What are practice points? Well, these are points to uh, help clinicians to better evaluate and implement specific and important aspects of care, uh, particularly when there is limited evidence. And these practice points may be form formatted as a table, a figure, or an algorithm. And I'll show you uh, what they mean. Importantly, uh, one should note that these practice points are consensus statements, and they are not necessarily generated from uh, good evidence. Uh, most of these practice points are actually based on limited evidence, and they are reflecting expert judgment on some of the uh, guidelines from the work group. So this is just to uh, compare the practice points versus the recommendations. Uh, in particular, the practice points uh, were uh, points that, uh, in which there was insufficient evidence uh, as opposed to recommendations. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to uh, tell you something about the difference in the table of contents between the 2012 and the 2020 guideline. And I think as you can see uh, from this slide, I've highlighted some of the changes. The uh, highlight changes in the 2020 table of contents are actually a change of the actual title of the chapters. But importantly, I just want to point out a few facts. Um, for example, the IgA nephropathy and Hanoshanline purpura nephritis chapters in the old guideline uh, were combined now into a single chapter called IgA nephropathy and IgA uh, vasculitis. And then you would also see that for the chapter on idiopathic membranous nephropathy, we've now moved on uh, to incorporate the use of um, the antibody. Uh, which I'm sure you know um, has been uh, in, in use for some time. Uh, there are two uh, antibodies uh, previously described by Boston's group, and I think recently uh, there uh, are actually three uh, three additional antibodies antibodies described. But since they were recently uh, described, they were not actually not included in this guideline. But it will be important to note that there are these changes. And then there are also some important changes uh, in the chapter. Um, for example, uh, the chapter on complement uh, has replaced the old chapter on MPGM because we now realize that complement actually pay, plays an important role uh, in the pathogenesis of uh, GN, particularly MPGN. And there is also a new proposed classification of focal segmental disease. Uh, which is now featured in the new guideline as opposed to the uh, previous version uh, of the guideline. Okay, now let me move on to talk about two specific uh, GN in the new guideline. The first one to talk about is lupus nephropathy. Importantly, uh, I'll just highlight the important in the new guideline. Um, the recommendation is to uh, is for uh, patients with SLE and lupus nephritis to be treated with hydro hydroxychloroquine or an equivalent anti-malarial agent unless contraindicated. And the evidence actually comes from this paper listed on the lower panel of the slide here, a 2012 and also a 2016 paper showing that patients who received an anti-malarial would have a more favorable outcome in terms of uh, the incidence of lupus nephritis, in terms of progression to ESRD, and also complete remission. And therefore, the new guideline would make this recommendation. This is a 1C uh, recommendation. There are some practice points to note, and I put up this slide just to show that apart from treatment, the guideline also places uh, an emphasis on um, 
the measures to attenuate the complications of disease and also the treatment arising from uh, the treat uh, the tr arising from treating patients with this condition. Importantly, for example, as highlighted by the arrows, uh, we use low dose aspirin for patients during pregnancy. Uh, the guideline places uh, emphasis on uh, uh, addressing infection risk, for example, the risks of herpes zoster, tuberculosis, you know, all these opportunistic infection in the face of immunosuppression, uh, the need for screening for particularly hepatitis B, C, and, and HIV, and also the need for hepatitis B vaccination, and also the appropriate vaccines uh, according to individual need. There is also a need for bone protection using calcium and vitamin D supplementation and also uh, avoidance of sun exposure using sunscreens and other measures and also importantly to preserve uh, fertility, um, the uh, uh, consideration for sperm or sacral pre preservation. Importantly, the guideline also uh, emphasize that the lifetime exposure to cyclosphosmide should be limited to less than 36 grams. Okay, let me now move on to the different classes of uh, lupus nephritis, and this is a practice point on an approach to the management of class 1 or 2 lupus nephritis, and you would see on the uh, left-hand side of the algorithm for patients with low level of proteinuria, immunosuppressive treatment would mainly be guided by the extrarenal manifestation of SLE, whereas for patients with heavy proteinuria, they should be evaluated for lupus potocytopathy and be treated as for minimal change disease uh, and also be considered for maintenance combination therapy with low dose steroid and another immunosuppressive agent. And then for patients with um, more severe disease, the class three and class four um, lupus nephritis, and you would see that the guideline recommends the use of corticosteroid plus either a low dose um, IV cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate based treatment. So you would see on this algorithm on the right hand panel that for patients with uh, active class uh, three or four lesions, with or without a class 5 component that these patients be treated with corticosteroid, high dose with a pulse and oral maintenance, plus either intravenous or oral cyclophosphamide given for six months or mycophenolate-based therapy, either in the form of mycophenolate morvitur or uh, mycophenolic acid. There is another on the far right hand side the option of using a calcineurin inhibitor plus a reduced dose um, mycophenolic acid. There are some caveats associated with this approach and they are listed here. For example, uh, a reduced corticosteroid protocol may be used and you will see on this table here that this is a practice point for a steroid to be reduced in the middle panel, is the standard dose, and on the right-hand panel is the reduced dose. It is important to recognize that intravenous cyclophosphamide should be used as the initial therapy for class 3 or 4 lupus nephritis in patients who have difficulty adhering to an oral regimen. So this is all to do with a compliance issue. Another practice point is on the use of mycophenolic acid-based therapy, which should be used as initial therapy in any form of proliferative lupus nephritis for patients at risk of infertility or in patients who have already had a previous exposure to a, to a significant amount of cyclophosphamide. And this is particularly relevant for Asian patients, which I've highlighted here. The next practice point uh, would be on the use of calcineurin inhibitors, and they should be reserved for patients who cannot or will not use standard uh, mycophenolic acid-based or cyclophosphamide-based uh, regimen. Other therapies, as listed here in the bottom row, may be considered instead of the recommended initial drugs for proliferative lupus nephritis in situations when there is patient intolerance, lack of availability, and cost issues. Lastly, 
um, the role of biologics uh, may be important. Um, they are especially important uh, in proliferative lupus nephritis. The literature is actually evolving, and we now know that there are some effective or promising biologics coming along, uh, but they have not yet been ready to be recommended as first line. And I believe these will be updated uh, in the online version of the guideline, and the use of biologics must be individualized. Okay, let me move on to now talk about the maintenance therapy. Uh, so after the completion of initial therapy, patients should be maintained on, um, uh, on MMF or MPA as first choice or azathioprine uh, as individually indicated, or in patients in home, they cannot tolerate both uh, of either MPA or azathioprine, the, con the use of calcineurin inhibitor can be considered. There are some caveats uh, to this recommendation, and they include the fact that isotherapine may be an alternative to MPA after initial therapy, um, particularly for patients who are considering pregnancy, and then also in patients who have been treated with corticosteroid, that they should be maintained on treatment for at least 12 months. And the third practice point is on the dosage of MMF and MPA. The fourth practice point is on uh, the use of some other agents for maintenance. But importantly, I want to highlight in red here that the total duration of initial immunosuppressive therapy um, should not be less than 36 months in patients with a proliferative form of lupus nephritis. Now on to um, the uh, class five, okay, the class five lupus nephritis. They are divided into either low grade or uh, proteinuria of nephrotic syndrome. Okay, and the point suggests that for patients with low grade proteinuria, they should be maintained on uh, conservative treatment plus hydroxychloroquine, whereas in patients with nephrotic syndrome, one should consider the combination of glucocorticoid with another agent as listed in the box. Okay. In the interest of time, I would move on to uh, another GN, uh, particularly important in Asia because of the high prevalence of the disease here, which is IgA nephropathy. Uh, work group members are listed on the right. The first uh, uh, point I want to um, list out is, the, is, is a practice point uh, on the availability of a, of a prediction tool, an IgA nephropathy prediction tool as a result of this 20 uh, 19 paper published in JAMA Internal Medicine uh, by Sean Barber uh, et al., um, in which you can now use this tool. It's available online. It's also available as an app that you only need to enter uh, the uh, EGFR at biopsy, blood pressure, proteinuria, age, race, including uh, whether it's Caucasian, Chinese, or Japanese, because this is, uh, these are the races where the uh, tool was derived from the use of RAS inhibitor and also the MEST score, and also whether or not there is previous immunosuppression prior to kidney biopsy. And then you can generate a, a risk score. Importantly, this tool does not determine the likely impact of any particular, and it does not provide any uh, 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 indication on prognosis. So these are the important points on this tool. Next, of course, is the importance of um, supportive care uh, in IgA nephropathy management. And the result from the STOP IgA trial uh, from Jürgen Flergen, uh, and you can see the New England paper and also this present paper showing uh, that if pa patients were effectively managed, uh, the measures is listed on the top here that a large number of patients may actually require immunosuppression. Okay. Now, this is recommendation 2.3.2. I think this is the only recommendation in, in the IGAN chapter. This is of 1B level of evidence in which patients with proteinuria more than 0.5 gram per day um, should actually receive a RAS blocker, irrespective of whether they have hypertension or not. Another recommendation, which is at 2B, it's the suggestion to for patients to remain uh, for patients to, uh, to receive a six-month course of corticosteroid therapy if they remain at risk of progression uh, despite maximal supportive care. And in the using of corticosteroid, one has to take into consideration here on this practice point box here, 
uh, for patients with low EGFR, patients with diabetes, obesity, latent infection, secondary diseases such as cirrhosis, active, active peptic ulcers, and also uncontrolled psychiatric illness. Okay, so this is a very contentious point in the management of patients who remain at risk of progression after maximal supportive care. This is a busy table. If you just concentrate on the middle part of this algorithm, you would see that for patients with EGFR less than 30, perhaps maximization of supportive care is all that one should do, whereas for patients who have EGFR more than 30, uh, one can actually um, uh, consider giving immunosuppressive therapy, mostly in the form of corticosteroid therapy. If you look at the right lower hand uh, a blue box there, there are some special population consideration. In Japanese, tonsillectomy is performed a lot, but outside Japan, uh, the utility of tons tonsillectomy may not be that great. And also in Chinese patients, one may consider using uh, MMF as a corticosteroid sparing agent. And this stems mainly uh, from the fact that um, there was a report published in 2017 showing no difference in outcomes in IgA nephropathy patients at risk of progression when they receive high-dose steroid versus low-dose steroid plus MMF. Okay, so coming to the end, I just want to acknowledge um, the uh, persons and also KDCO authors providing some of the slides to me. And very importantly, I would like to also promote the Asian Pacific Congress of Nephrology 2020, which is now rescheduled to October 2nd to 4th in Hong Kong. And I'm pleased to announce that we have invited three eminent plenary speakers, uh, Professor uh, Peter John Ratcliffe, uh, Professor Patel, and also Professor K.Y. Yun, who is a, a world-renowned authority in, COVID, in the fight against COVID-19, as, as well as SARS in Hong Kong. The APCM will be a hybrid meeting in which there will be a physical meeting in Hong Kong, but we also would uh, include a simultaneous online component to allow participation from delegates from all over the world. And importantly, we are now calling for abstracts, late-breaking abstracts for COVID-19. I think with that, I would like to thank uh, you for listening. Thank you for a very comprehensive presentation, Prof. Tang. Just a reminder to participants that we will keep the questions and answers to the end, but please continue posting your questions online so that we can identify the common queries and prioritize them. Moving on now to the second speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Edgar Lerma. Professor Edgar is the author of more than 100 publications and presentations, and he serves on numerous uh, editorial boards for books and journals. He has been the official KDGO social media ambassador since 2017 and was recently appointed as the KDGO Knowledge Translation Lead. This afternoon, he's going to share with us on the special considerations managing GN during the COVID pandemic. Over to you, Prof. Lerma. Thank you very much, Dr. Baba Nandan. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about special considerations in the management of glomerular nephritis during the COVID pandemic. So um, as many of us are aware, a lot of publications have been out there uh, in um, mainstream publications and also in me medical journals, such as uh, this one. The, I'm just going to show a couple of uh, publications here about uh, the link between kidney disease and COVID-19. Uh, this one, this uh, couple of publications from Kidney International and this other one, um, uh, also in Kidney International. Now, I want to say we try to summarize some of these papers um, in this uh, visual graphic. And you can see here that um, on the top left corner, the incidence of AKI ranges between 0 0.5 to 29% based on the current studies uh, that have been published so far. Uh, but what's interesting is that a lot of these patients with AKI actually have urinary abnormalities such as proteinuria, hematuria, or even both. And a lot of these patients also manifest with comorbidities uh, like cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, and hypertension to note. Now, when you look at this paper, and um, 
you would see that among 701 patients with COVID-19 who were admitted to a hospital in Wuhan, China, 43.9% had proteinuria, while 26.7% had hematuria. This finding may actually point towards immune system activation during active COVID-19 infection, which may in turn increase the risk of relapse in patients with immune-mediated kidney diseases. Um, so, on the other hand, if you look at the second paper that I highlighted, uh, you'll see severe COVID-19 infection is also associated with severe lymphopenia, which actually could slow the progression of these immune-mediated glomerular diseases if immunosuppression has to be temporarily discontinued. So, as a sort of a disclaimer, um, what we're going to talk about is really more opinion-based. Uh, not necessary. A lot of these are not necessarily evidence-based. Uh, you might put it as uh, these are best practice uh, recommendations or suggestions. As we know, at the present time, there are really no data available on the safety of immunosuppressive treatments in patients with COVID-19 infections. And most of our practices really are evolving. We are trying to understand more of the disease. Uh, but dealing with patients with glomerular diseases or what we call immune-mediated kidney diseases becomes particularly challenging. So here is an outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, well, I'm going to talk about immunosuppression, uh, diagnosis and monitoring, supportive care, as well as office management. I am not going to cover uh, transplant patients as well as COVID-19 therapies in general. So um, for those of you who might be interested to know more about the, this topic, uh, these are actually the sources uh, that I've used for this talk. So these are publications in CJSON, in uh, Nature, NDT, um, and these are also the recommendations from the Renal Association. And um, on the left, lower uh, left um, corner, you could see that there's a um, social media platform, uh, Glomcon, or Glomerular Conference, wherein the, uh, Dr. Logan and other speakers were asked about uh, management of glomerular diseases in the COVID era. So, in essence, there are really no perfect or even evidence-based answers to these and many other queries. But, you know, these papers that I've mentioned offer insights as to how glomerular disease experts have adapted the management of patients with these diseases to reduce complications of potential COVID-19 infection. So I want to show you this slide. Um, you know, cellular immunity is really the key in determining the course and outcome of coronavirus uh, uh, infections, but this is compromised in patients on immunosuppression, particularly those patients with glomerular diseases. The recommendations that I'm going to present here are based on very little direct evidence, but what we're trying to aim here is to balance the need to maintain viral host defense mechanisms versus the need to suppress the immune system to treat the glomerular disease that's underlying. So the guiding principles are to avoid oversuppression of T-cells and to consider the use of immunosuppression that may inhibit mechanisms of kidney injury and the cytokine storm that seems to be involved in most cases of COVID-19. So remember that abrupt reduction or discontinuation of immunosuppression can potentially result in a flare of the underlying glomerular disease, thereby putting the kidney at risk and Moreover, requiring intensification of immunosuppression, um, close follow-up of GN is actually required. So the next slide I want to show you, this is from the NDT publication, uh, shows you the risk stratification of patients with glomerular diseases uh, during the COVID pandemic. Patients with immune-mediated kidney disease should be regarded as at risk to experience a more severe disease course of COVID-19 as compared to the general population. And there are many reasons for this. One, uh, a lot of patients may be elderly and may have comorbidities that are known to enhance the risk of adverse outcomes 
uh, in the presence of an infection. Uh, number two, the chronic kidney disease itself is associated with impaired host defense, which normally is needed to battle the viral infection. Third, the medications used to control autoimmune kidney diseases also suppresses host defense mechanisms that are, again, needed to combat these infections. And, of course, infections are an important cause of mortality in these patients. So individual risk assessment can assist decision-making uh, for more or less rigid preventive measures or disease-related interventions. Um, one of the things that was uh, presented during the glomerular conference by Dr. Robin was that he suggested that when we deal with these patients with glomerular diseases, it might be helpful to divide patients into three scenarios. Um, one, those with a new diagnosis or relapsing disease. Um, those, the number two, those who are at maintenance phase of immunosuppressive treatment. Um, and then number three, those who are on long-term remission with ongoing tapering of immunosuppression. So who are these patients who are going to be at high risk for progression if not treated? Um, so the patients who are at high risk would be those with rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, like patients with crescentic GN, uh, such as lupus, uh, anti glomerulonephritis, anti-GBM disease, as well as those patients with um, severe nephrotic syndrome. Um, severe nephrotic syndrome meaning to say those patients with reduction in kidney function, um, those with complications related to proteinuria and hypoalbuminemia like epinous thrombosis and anasarca, um, and of course accompanied by increased susceptibility to infections due to say low immunoglobulin concentrations and depression of T cell function. So for these patients, um, it is recommended or it is suggested that standard of care immunosuppression regimens be rendered for these patients. However, um, one needs to consider increasing intervals or postponing scheduled infusions with biologicals uh, for therapy. For example, uh, rituximab for systemic vasculitis in lupus. You know, it has been shown that if rituximab is used for the management of GN, patients may not be able to develop antibodies against the COVID-19, and this could also be uh, posing a risk for reinfection. How about um, immunoabsorption? Um, it has been suggested that, you know, immunoabsorption uh, al along with uh, low-dose mycophenolate mofetal or calcineurin inhibitors and a reduced dosage of glucocorticoids may be considered in patients with active lupus nephritis. For those with antivasculitis, um, immunomodulatory therapy with immunoglobulins has been demonstrated to be associated with a rapid reduction of disease activity and can be an option for patients with COVID-19. Um, also, um, most studies in patients with anti associated vasculitis have found increased levels of interleukin-6 and most other cytokines in the blood and sites of active vasculitis, such that treatment with tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 receptor inhibitor, is being investigated as a potential therapy for this infection. Um, but tocilizumab has been a promising agent for the management of cytokine release syndrome in COVID-19. And let us also not forget that uh, some of these patients um, may have a poor vaccination response um, when vaccines are available against COVID-19. So I want to show you the slide, which is um, basically the uh, Pectivas trial. Um, we know that in patients with COVID-19 and active uh, anti-GBM disease or severe ankle vasculitis, low dose of steroids plus extracorporeal measures may be considered. Um, plasma exchange has a clear indication in anti-GBM disease. And although this trial failed to show long-term benefit of plasma exchange in ANCA vasculitis, it may be useful in the short term to mitigate 
against AA uh, anti-associated vasculitis and may allow decreased use of steroids or decreased lower doses of steroids. Um, plasma exchange, whenever performed, should be done against fresh frozen plasma and convalescent plasma may be used at the end of the session if the patient has COVID-19 infection. The next slides I want to show you here are some infusion suite strategies to reduce risk of COVID-19 infection. These are actually uh, um, guidelines suggested by the American College of Rheumatology for patients who are actually receiving infusion medications. Uh, and you could just go through the slides here, uh, like postpone non-essential infusions, um, recommend social distancing, use of face masks, uh, uh, frequently clean and decontaminate equipment, uh, again, social distancing and uh, hygiene procedures, and remote check-ins. Um, furthermore, uh, they recommend screening staff with temperature checks at the beginning of their shift, beginning and end of their shifts, and also screen patients by phone prior to their visit about infectious symptoms. So how about those patients who may not be at high risk for progression? So these are patients with membranous nephropathy or arising anti-PLA2R titer, but without complications and with preserved GFR. Patients with minimal change disease or FSGS with preserved GFR. And of course, IgA nephropathy patients with endocapillary hypercellularity and or low percentage burden with preserved GFR. Uh, this just shows you the MESS classification and the MESS C classification. But the bottom line among these diseases that are not at high risk for progression is really most of these patients have preserved GFR. And for these patients, one may postpone the treatment uh, until local transmission rates of COVID-19 are low enough um, such that social distancing measures may no longer be recommended or that they can be relaxed. Um, so the next slide, um, for patients wherein there is not a validated standard of care regimen, like patients with immune complex or complement mediated forms of MPGN, um, use of immunosuppression is not currently recommended regardless of clinical parameters. So again, showing you those, um, for those patients, on the other hand, who have already started immunosuppression before the pandemic, uh, these patients require a risk assessment regarding continuation of immunosuppression. Remember, not all patients with immune-mediated kidney diseases are at the same risk for unfortunate outcomes. And patient and virus-related risk factors allow stratifying of these patients for different levels of preventive measures uh, before or during uh, COVID-19 infection. So um, this risk-benefit um, assessment sh should be individualized. So for patients who are on intravenous induction regimen, this can be changed to an equivalent oral induction regimen. For those patients receiving pulse IV methylprednisolone, um, this is, can be changed to high-dose oral prednisone or oral methylprednisolone. Um, and then, of course, for patients with stable um, GFR, stable renal function, on chronic immunosuppression, um, one can lower the dose to the safest level that will maintain remission. Now, if patients test positive for COVID-19 and have only mild viral symptoms or they are asymptomatic, it has been suggested that lowering the glucocorticoid dose to less than or equal to 30 milligrams daily and halting other immunosuppression that reduce lymphocyte numbers. If the patient, on the other hand, presents with severe COVID-19, it is recommended that glucocorticoid use should likely be minimized to 20 milligrams daily. But remember that such treatment decisions should be made on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, again, 
going back to the fact that as abrupt the discontinuation of immunosuppression uh, is um, taken, is um, rendered, this may result in a flare of the underlying glomerular disease, which may put the kidney at risk uh, later on. Now, for those patients, on the other hand, whose disease has been in remission for at least 12 months, uh, one may actually consider this immediate discontinuation of anti-metabolites, such as uh, uh, azathioprine. And then, of course, for those with sustained remission on main, who are on maintenance steroids, um, if they are on low and alternate daily dose steroids, one can discontinue, it, can discontinue them. And or if they're still on a higher dose, one can begin a taper with those adjustments every two weeks. So as many glomerular disease patients are actually young and without really a lot of comorbidities, um, some of these patients who are relatively asymptomatic or with mild symptoms can be managed at home without the need for hospitalization. Um, Again, highlighting the fact that, one, we need to discontinue anti-metabolites as part of their management, and they have to be followed up closely. Um, in Columbia University uh, in New York, uh, which is a, a big um, center for glomerular diseases, um, they do not adjust the dose of calcineurin inhibitors. Um, and this is in line with the recent studies published by the, uh, in the transplant um, uh, uh, area wherein it has been shown that patients with COVID-19 IUG um, uh, recipients who were maintained on CNIs alone uh, with the anti-metabolite health, it appeared that they had similar hospital-based outcomes when they were compared to non-immunosuppressed COVID-19 patients. And there were also previous studies, in vitro studies or in vitro data mainly for cyclosporine that show that low doses of calcineurin inhibitors may actually reduce replication for coronaviruses. How about those patients who require hospitalization for COVID-19 illnesses? Um, for these patients, treatment should be discontinued and steroids should be tapered to zero until full recovery from the infection. Um, although symptomatic patients with mild covid 19 may stay at home, we really need to render close surveillance for aggravating symptoms in these patients, uh, monitor them for fevers, uh, so on and so forth. And when one suspects clinically, patients should be referred to uh, um, a hospital or uh, an institution immediately, and they should not be delayed because the clinical presentation of these patients may deteriorate rapidly and early intervention may actually be potentially life-saving. Note that patients with glomerular diseases who actually require hospitalization for COVID-19 respiratory illnesses, again, less in, it's important to hold off their anti-metabolites, um, but if you are also going to um, admit them to the hospital because of severe infection, uh, they may need to be uh, given stress dose of steroids uh, if they were already previously on a long-term regimen or a chronic dose of steroids. So how about kidney biopsies? Uh, kidney biopsies are considered elective procedures. A lot of institutions have um, um, put a uh, pause on, the, on these procedures. Uh, again, on a case-by-case -case basis, if the patients have uh, rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis, it may be prudent to continue and proceed with a biopsy in those patients, as the results of the biopsy will definitely guide the treatment. Um, patients with apparent primary nephrotic syndrome and preserved GFR probably should not undergo biopsies at this time as they can be managed empirically with calcineurin inhibitors and one can schedule a biopsy at a later date. Um, it has been suggested um, that the use of anti-PLA2R antibody testing to diagnose primary membranous nephropathy um, may actually be helpful in this situation. Protocol biopsies, on the other hand, to assess the efficacy of immunosuppression and activity versus chronicity 
as well as research biopsies for clinical trials or observational studies should be canceled or put on hold. Now, fortunately, the field of glomerular diseases has been moving in the direction whereby we are trying to um, minimize immunosuppression in patients with glomerular diseases. Um, and again, um, I know Dr. Tang has mentioned some of these studies. Um, the PET-CIVA study with non-inferior outcomes in ANCA-associated GN with decreased dose of steroids versus standard dose of steroids. The STOP IGAN and the testing studies uh, argued against the use of high-dose corticosteroids in IGA nephropathy. And the mentor study um, found better long-term outcomes with just one or two dosing intervals of rituximab versus uh, year-long therapy with cyclosporin. Um, so in recapping, um, again, we talked about immunosuppression, diagnosis and monitoring, supportive care, as well as office. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about office management. So remember, for immunosuppression, we recommend discontinuing anti-metabolites uh, for patients with confirmed or suspected infection, uh, and also in patients with sustained remission over 12 months. There's little evidence also, I have to say, that complement inhibitors impair antiviral immunity, but direct experience with COVID-19 is really lacking. Um, we favor short-acting reversible agents over long-acting infusions. Um, we recommend not, uh, not to give ter uh, initiation of therapy in patients with marginal criteria or non-standard indications, and avoid treatment for patients with minimally symptomatic patients with stable GFR. Um, Again, convert IV infusions to oral formulation if possible. Sometimes one can avail of home infusion services uh, as opposed to having the patient come to the hospital or uh, to the clinic. Um, regarding trials, um, new enrollment into clinical trials have been put on hold in light of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so there are no new enrollments. However, patients who are already enrolled in these trials um, can still benefit and our patients should continue on the study drug with closer monitoring. Um, a lot of single arm and also some randomized controlled trials, particularly those in phase two or phase three, allow patients access to novel or unapproved therapies and less, they, therefore they still have the prospect of benefit. Um, again, reserve biopsies for crit critical decision making uh, needs uh, consider empirical treatment with biopsy without biopsy in some cases, and then also postpone uh, protocol biopsies. Um, limit blood draws to safety laboratories, perform at commercial uh, laboratories. Um, you know, sometimes the schedule, uh, if they come in early in the morning or late in the evening, they might have less uh, patient traffic. Um, there's also use of uh, home urine dipsticks for proteinuria monitoring. Um, we use this for patients with, uh, um, who, who are chronic uh, GN patients in whom we rely on them to tell us if their uh, dipstick are showing more proteinuria, so on and so forth. Uh, we also recommend utilizing commercially shipped collection kits for 24-hour urine collections. Um, and this can be ordered, some, I think some of this can be ordered online. Regarding the use of ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, um, based on the current scientific evidence, we recommend not to stop treatment with these medications. Um, how about um, uh, hydroxychloroquine? Um, for patients already on chronic hydroxychloroquine for maintenance therapy, uh, we recommend to continue the drug at the same dose. Um, and if hydroxychloroquine is used with azithromycin, uh, recommend close monitoring of the calcium levels as well as a baseline EKG um, and make sure that they have normal QT intervals. Um, 
this is uh, this slide shows you uh, from this is from the Cape um, Beagle 2012 guidelines, and I know Dr. Tang showed an updated version of the recommendation for use of hydrochloroquine, hydroxychloroquine for patients with lupus nephritis. This used to be a 2C recommendation, but I see now it's a 1C recommendation. Uh, there is benefit in these patients, uh, so do not uh, withhold hydroxychloroquine in these patients. Um, and again, however, let us remember that at the present, there is no scientific evidence that is sufficient to advocate use for the prevention of COVID-19 right now. Um, encourage social distancing. Uh, that's important and cannot be underemphasized. Encourage use of face masks. Uh, complete recommended vaccinations. Um, and also change all appointments to telemedicine video visits. You know, um, allow office staff to manage phones and patient messages from home. Um, it might also be beneficial to have uh, you know, write a standard script of recommendations for patients who are calling in uh, with questions about possible COVID-19 exposure, again, based on um, CDC guidelines. Of course, use telemedicine video visits rather than telephone calls for patients concerned about COVID-19 infections. Um, it's, it's helpful to assess the patient, at least visually, when you do telemedicine video as opposed to just uh, hearing them on the telephone. So um, this is probably my most important slide, um, which summarizes everything that I've discussed. Uh, I know this uh, presentation would be available online later on. And at this point, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, Nadigo, as well as Novartis, and Dr. Babanandan and Dr. Kang for this uh, opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the very engaging presentation, Prof. Lerma. We have a number of questions sent in. Perhaps, Prof. Tang, could you take the first few? There are a number on the subject of um, pregnancy and lactation in lupus nephritis patients. The first yes. one is, in a patient contemplating pregnancy who has been on MMF for one year and has achieved remission, does the patient still need to be on any therapy? Yes, I think the guideline suggests that uh, if the patient has a proliferative form of lupus nephritis, okay, I think I think we are talking about the class three and four uh, type of nephritis, that these patients should be on immunosuppression for at least uh, 36 months. And I believe that if the patient uh, is on an MMF-based treatment and has been in remission for, did you say a year? then I believe that these patients yeah. could be switched over from MMF to azathioprine in order for uh, the consideration of becoming pregnant to take place. Okay. I, right. Um, any um, other medications that they might be on? I think you did allude to them um, if yes, they now I become the, pregnant. Oh, yes. I think the, the RAS blockers. Yeah, if the patient is on a RAS blocker for, let's say, control of hypertension or proteinuria, and if the patient is contemplating uh, pregnancy, that these blockers uh, should also be uh, stopped prior to conception. I believe okay. that uh, the guidelines suggest. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, the second question on the same area is, can patients with SLE on induction or maintenance therapy be lactating or breastfeeding? Yes, so it depends on, yeah, I think the answer to this question is yes, because, I mean, uh, the uh, the immunosuppressive agents, they most of the agents, they actually do not cross the, um, uh, I mean, they do not enter uh, breast milk readily. So most of these agents can be considered to be continued. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Tang. Um, a question now for Prof. Lerma. Um, is there any information that suggests the susceptibility of end-stage renal disease patients for COVID infections is higher, but lethality is lower? 
Yeah, you know, again, the the data is mixed right now. Uh, there's been some suggestion that, uh, um, you know, patients uh, with end-stage renal disease may have milder forms of COVID-19 infections. But we're not necessary. you know, again, I, I think this is mostly anecdotal uh, at this point. Um, um, it's it's kind of difficult to tease out the information just because a lot of these patients are have too many comorbidities uh, to actually say that, okay, the, the end-stage kidney disease is actually more protective than anything else. So I, 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 I would not say that, but... Um, just remember that a lot of our uh, end-stage kidney disease with all of these comorbidities have a lot of risk factors and, per, and therefore may be at higher risk for more complications. Okay. Thank you very much for taking that question. Um, back to Prof. Tang. There's a question here on the role of plasma exchange in severe cases of lupus nephritis. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. I think uh, plasma exchange for uh, severe lupus is actually not uh, included in the guideline. So uh, it is uh, not a form of therapy that should be recommended for patients, especially for patients with a proliferative form of, of um, uh, lupus nephritis. They should be considered to be given uh, high-dose corticosteroid with uh, either uh, intravenous or oral forms of cyclophosphamide or uh, MMF, or in selected cases, a uh, calcineurin inhibitor. And I would also like to supplement that um, uh, on the previous question on lactation, that uh, the immunosuppressive that are the immunosuppressive agents that are considered to be safe for mothers to continue while breastfeeding uh, include not only corticosteroid, calcineurin inhibitor, but also cycles, uh, and but also uh, azathioprine and also tacrolimus. Okay. Um, moving on now to the management of IgA nephropathy, there's a question here. Um, any recommendations on management of crescentic IgA nephropathy? Yes, crescentic IgA nephropathy has not been covered uh, uh, during, during the talk uh, because of uh, uh, limitation of time, but crescentic IgA nephropathy should be treated as for a severe form of uh, uh, RPGN, rapidly progressive form of GN, with uh, aggressive therapy, uh, because otherwise the patient's condition uh, or the renal function uh, may uh, deteriorate rather rapidly. So uh, I'm not sure if that's on uh, a table, but uh, the um, treatment should actually resemble uh, the treatment for AAV, ANCA-associated forms of vasculitis. So the previous mentioning okay. of using corticosteroid or uh, other forms of treatment uh, does not apply to patients with the so-called variant forms of IgA nephropathy, including patients with uh, rapidly progressive GN. AKI and also minimal change disease, they should um, uh, they should adapt to the corresponding therapy. Thank you for the answer. I think perhaps we'll just take one last question. Um, there's a question here: um, What pattern of COVID-related AKI includes microangiopathy, and would this justify early use of plasmapheresis in such patients? So. Um I, I, thank you for that question. You know, again, this is an area which is um, um, the, the, the answer is probably not definite. Uh, certainly, um, in, in personally, in my experience, I have uh, uh, plasma breeze some of these patients, and some of them have gotten better, some of them have not. Uh, there's been some case reports of patients having thrombotic microangiopathy, which makes you think that perhaps there's a complement mediated mechanism in this uh, in the, in this illness uh, but I, again I, I don't think you can make a blanket statement and say uh, plasma is everybody who presents uh, in this manner uh, with COVID-19 infection just to preempt it so I, I think again it's on individual basis a case-by-case basis uh, the way you approach them thanks Prof. Lerma um, Unfortunately, we need to close this session now as we're running past the hour. 
Um, I'd like to thank the participants for joining us, the speakers for their excellent lectures, and both Novartis and KDU Guild for making this educational webinar possible. Um, I think it's been a very useful session for everyone, and I wish everyone um, a safe uh, passage through the remaining uh, part of this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, goodbye, everyone. Take care.